What's going on, everybody? Welcome into the July 1st, 2024 edition of the Daily Energy Newsbeat Stand Up. Here are today's top headlines. First up, China surpasses Europe per capita in energy consumptions. Shocker there. Next up, status of U.S. dollar as global reserve currency. Central banks diversify from USD assets to other currencies and to gold. Next up, mining the planet for renewable energy. Love a good play on words there. Next up, bipartisan consensus in favor of renewable power is ending. And finally, we'll end with Supreme Court overturns controversial Chevron decision curtailing federal agencies power in a major shift. Stool then toss it over to me. I will quickly cover what happened in the oil and gas markets, mainly cover the the oil price dropping relative uh, to expectations on Friday. We'll also look at rig counts, another big drop there. We did also on Friday see a pretty great ENP consolidation, SM Energy buying XL or XCL resources. Mm-hmm. Also a little bit of a non-op throw in there with Northern Oil and Gas, a really Really awesome transaction, to be honest with you. The stuff I've been reading about it recently has it actually it, it looks pretty good. So we will cover that. We also then will finish up with the Dallas Fed survey. A lot of interesting quotes in there that got released on Wednesday, Stu, that we need to cover. So we will get to all of that and a bag of chips, guys. As always, I am Michael Tanner, joined by Stuart Turley. Where do you want to begin? Hey, let's start with our buddies over there in China. You can't buy this kind of entertainment, Michael. China surpasses Europe in per capita energy consumption. Quote, this is out of the article. China has changed the energy world, but now China is changing the International Energy Agency, the IEA, the IEA reported in their 2030 flagship world outlook, the second largest economy in the world has saturated its own market after years of building roads and buildings and other infrastructure as fast as it possibly could. The vast Chinese domestic market is finally about tapped. Here's where it gets really, really crazy. If the fact that the deindustrialization of the Europe because they have gone to renewables, has really impacted this number. So it's not just a, oh, by the way, China is increasing the per capita of energy Mm -hmm. use. It is because Germany is de-industrializing because of their energy policies. Here's a, a line in here that just really will whack you upside the head. Quote, we cannot, we should not ignore the energy and emissions that the Europeans have effectively exported to Chinese manufacturers. Energy Institute Chief Executive Officer Nick Wyeth recently told Bloomberg, if a decline in energy consumption and emissions in Europe simply boosts carbon output somewhere else, policies to tackle global global climate change aren't working. Well, you know what? All of the manufacturing of the pollutants for wind and solar are made in China. They're increasing all of the profits, and then they're using that to build their their standard of living and everything else. This is just a scam as the whole thing. Well, I mean, again, as I said, shocker here, China's starting to use more energy. I mean, it, it went with, when you have population that's increasing like China has— you know, obviously we know they, they they've dropped a little bit off what they were doing back when they had the one the one child policy. But relative to what Europe, Europe is flatlining when it comes to policy. So this is just a matter of population. I do think this comes down to, you know, now why China is just getting as much energy as possible. It's why they're going back to coal. It's why they're diving headfirst into all this stuff. It's because they know their energy demand is going to be going through the roof. And they are still stockpiling oil and natural and natural gas LNG, and they have new pipeline contracts, and all that is a precursor to war. Yeah. So let's go. To the- Fun <laughs> stuff. Sorry. What's next? Let's go to the status of the U.S. global reserve currency. Central banks diversify from USD assets to other currencies into gold. I got I gotta love it for Wolf Richer and Wolf Street. He does such a great job. Everybody, run out there. We've got the link in the in the article there. He does a great job breaking this out. He says the U.S. dollar is still the most dominant global reserve, but there are several different charts.
months. And if we look from 2015, we were at 66% of global reserve currencies. And then you see that we're now down to 59% ballpark in that area. Holy smokes, that's a heck of a decline in 2024 since 2015. It really is. And we've seen all of this oil now being trading in other currencies other than the dollar. And we know the oil is the main reason why the dollar has been as valuable as it is. Yes, I think these numbers are are crazy. I think we've also seen with Russia and how the sanctions on Russia haven't really worked. And I think People are kind of, and when I mean people, I think some of these central banks are thinking, wow, wait a second here. What, oh, yeah. What, why Why would I? Why would you want to put your money with the U.S.? I don't know. But the there are some fantastic charts in here. And the rise of gold is a central bank reserve asset. Gold bullion is not included in the foreign exchange reserves of banks and all the data above. But gold bullion holdings in the overall reserve asset of banks are, after spending decades on their old holdings, have been rebuilding them, especially China and Russia. And it's because that's going to be backing BRICS. So well, we know BRICS is coming. We know it's the BRICS dollar. We got it. Hey, let's go to the next article. Oh, let's go to the next article. I just thought I'd get my arm up for your arm. Mining the planet for renewable energy. I'll tell you, and control over energy, the lifeblood of our civilization, jobs, health, and prosperity. Will America shut down coal, gas, nuclear, electrical generation before it has su uh, sufficient, reliable replacements? Will we have electricity when we need it or only when it's available? <laughs> Can you imagine if you had to just sit there and think that you're going to watch a TV show maybe one hour a day? Yeah. I, I'm just saying, think about in your fur coat there in your apartment with no AC except for 15 minutes a day. It would be, um, that would be horrible. I would die. Uh, Oh, it is. And, and so the IEA says its projections are highly dependent on how quickly and stringently the world actually tries to reach zero greenhouse gas emissions in order to power generate all energy uses. I think net zero is dumb. I have to hand it to, I, I swear, Fetterman had to have died, and then they rolled in a body double because that man's brilliant now, and he said it's not about the Green New Deal. It's about pollution. Arnold Schwarzenegger also said the same thing. Arnold is now on It's About Pollution. Whoa! I about fell out of my chair. It's about pollution, folks. It's it, not it, about it, greenhouse gases. No, it really is. Well, it's about taking back control a little bit from who currently has it right now. You know, very interesting. I mean, as we get closer and closer to the election, things are going to start getting a lot more intertwined. You're going to start seeing a lot more of these think pieces. A great article from Paul Dreesen kind of overviewing the whole thing, but as we get closer and closer to this election, things are, are as you say, it's going to get, get weird. a little creepier. Uh, the biggest wind right. energy project in the U.S. will soon blanket 1,600 square miles, 1.2 times uh, size size of Delaware in New Mexico to generate 3,500 megawatts, about 30% of the year. Oh, what? That's crazy. What? Only 30% of the year? You're only there? The Palo Verde nuclear plant in Arizona generates 4,200 from six square miles, 24 by seven. Holy smokes. What a waste. It, it's We've been saying it for years. What a waste. What a waste. Hey, bipartisan consensus. Let's go to the next story. A bipartisan consensus in favor of renewable power is ending. I think people are starting to wake up. The growing partisan divide in support of the expanding wind solar power of the U.S., percent of who are in favor of wind power is it's not looking good. No, I mean, it's, I mean, let's just be honest here, guys. It, if you look at the charts, if you want to put that chart up here, growing partisan divide, you can see it exactly. I mean, Republicans have dropped all the way from 16, from 87% down to 64%, wind power from 80% down to 56%. But you know, lean Democrat, things are fairly flat. So if you forecast and see these trends going differently, it's going to become one of the major issues in exactly. this 2024 
election cycle, the difference in what we do with energy. We saw Trump in the debate on Thursday. He said, drill, baby, drill in no lesser terms. We didn't hear much from Biden, though. I think we can already know kind of where he stands or where his team stands, per se. So, you know, this is going to become a choke point as we continue to move closer and closer, as I mentioned, to this 2024 election. And that really ties in. This whole thread ties in to, together with the Supreme Court. This last article, Michael, Supreme Court overturned Chevron decision curtailing federal agencies in major power shift in the Chevron decision. This is an amazing 80 year story of overreach by our government. This is a total ability for the next administration to clean out the deep state in many ways how the the chevron the megan lap with sea freeze fisheries is going to be on david blackman's energy question on july 3rd and i had the chance to interview her a little while ago as well the chevron decision was about the overreach of the government forcing inspectors on boats and they were having to pay their salaries their health insurance and everything else. And it was coming around to about $700 a day on a small boat. That's a lot of money for a small family boat that was overreaching. So the decision basically says if the law is poorly written, Michael, it used to, the, the, the decision was when you filed under this defense, you had to say, well, then it all defaults or all ties go to the state, go to the federal government. And that means that you really had to go all the way to the Supreme Court every time you wanted to fight this, yep. the, the government. Now, an appellate court can solve the problem. This is huge for the consumers because now the appellate courts can do it. So, man, vote for your local judges. Yeah. It's, that's the big thing I was going to say. I think you guys, David Blackman did a great, great job on the three podcasters breaking this all down. So I, I've got really not much to add is, yes, local politicians are and specifically local judges are going to be critical if you care about this type of stuff. Because that's exactly what you said. It's what the Supreme Court said. Kick it back down. We don't have to rule on this stuff now. Oh, absolutely. And and so we are recording this on a Sunday evening and we don't know, you know, uh, the fallout from that debate is still going to be seen because if Biden, if Jill Biden still wants him to run is going to be, you know, is he going to be asked to step down? Is she want to even say yes? Who is going to step in? Is it going to be Michelle Obama? Is it going to be Hillary? Is it going to be Gavin Newsom? How are they going to pay off? You know, but all that, all of this is just in the, in the up in the air about energy policies, Michael. This is the biggest impact of energy policies I have ever seen in an election. Well, because the problem with having government agencies create policy is every four years you get a new agency and every four years you get a new you get a new direction oh, yes. you get a new change and it really is hard to plan it's one thing we're going to talk about when we get to the dallas fed survey but uh, but no let's go ahead and pop over and and cover oil and gas prices before we do that guys we got to pay the bills as always check us out dot energy dot Tom, the best place for all your energy and oil and gas news. Stu and the team do a tremendous job making sure that website stays up to speed. Everything you need to know to be the tip of the spear when it comes to the energy and the oil and gas business. Hit the description for all of the links to the articles we covered. You can also check us out on Substack, theenergynewsbeat.substack.com. Check us out there. And you can also check us out, dashboard.energynewsbeat.com. Go ahead and give us a subscribe over at Substack. We're running as you listen to this, guys, on Monday morning. Morning. We actually are recording this Sunday afternoon, meaning if you go to our Substack, you can hear tomorrow's news today thrown right into your inbox. Go check us out there again, guys, energynewsbeat.substack.com. You know, prices on Friday, a little weak relative to what people were expecting. We saw U.S. fuel demand drop a little bit. We did see hedge funds take a little bit of profit off the table and cut their long positions. Um, but overall, S&P 500 was down about a, a four-tenths of a percentage point. NASDAQ dropped about half a percentage point. Ten-year yield up only about one percentage points 
or excuse me, two-year yields will up one percentage point, 10-year up 2.7 percentage points, dollar index down about a tenth of a percentage point. We have we see Bitcoin now trading up two percentage points, $62,000. Crude oil down about a quarter of a percentage point, 81.54. Uh, Brent down 1.5 percentage points, 85.27. We saw natural gas tumble about three percentage points, $2.68. Mainly from a crude oil standpoint, we did see U.S. gasoline demand fall via the EIA. We did see personal consumption inflation in line with forecasts. We also did see if we can go ahead and throw this up, Miss Producer rig counts, another seven off rig counts. So wow. companies continue to shed rigs as we get closer and closer to this election. I think a lot of people are worried about what's going to happen. I think as we're going to see in the Dallas Fed survey, there is there's a very interesting subplot going on right now in the oil and gas business relative to this election. Nonetheless, though, Canada saw 10 rigs up and internationally we saw 25 rigs drop. You know, the the other finance piece before we get into the Dallas Fed survey is SM Energy. They go ahead and announce a $2.55 billion acquisition of XC Resources. The Uinta Basin, gotta love some Utah oil and gas love. They go ahead and buy XCL Resources, which again is a private company backed by NCAP and Rice Investment Groups. Man, NCAP's having a having a cut a good year and a half with sales relative net purchase price to SM though was only about 2.04 billion dollars because what happened at the same time was Northern Oil and Gas comes in and swoops. 20% of the acquisition for about $510 million for a even, as I mentioned, 20% XL or SM gets 80% of the assets. Some really interesting stuff here. I, I had, you know, the U Basin has been something I think everybody now is, you know, with this acquisition, people are saying, oh, I've known about this for so long. Eh, most people aren't really paying it that much attention to the U Basin, but some of the, some of the numbers here are quite fascinating. We'll get to a little, we'll get to an overview of some of the reserves there in a second, but let's just go over some highlights here. It's 30,000 net acres, 199% operated. It's about 43,000 barrels of oil a day, which 88% of that is crude oil, which is absolutely unbelievable. Um, brings SM's net production to somewhere around 190 5,000 BOE a day. They claim they get about 390 net locations to throw in their inventory. Might be interesting. About a $50 per BOE cash production margin, which is absolutely, which is pretty interesting. And they get about 107 million BOE of preliminary reserves, which Im increase their net proof reserves by about 18%. Um, deal gets in at about 2.9 uh, adjusted EBITDA. You know, we see the word accretive about 45 times in this presentation. So good for them. Really gets them into a different different basin. So I want to throw this up here. So, I mean, again, the Uinta Basin is something that's, that's a little bit more off the radar, I don't think many people are, are spending that much time, you know, analyzing what's going on in the Uinta. The, 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 the interesting part is there has been some data that has come out in, in, you know, recently, obviously, since this acquisition. And I want to throw this chart up here. This is from Ted Cross. He's over there at Novi Labs. We love them. Uh, they do a lot of good data work over there. But basically what he's what he's showing here and what he says is that he has heard from people in the business, specifically with some of their clients that they have that are in the Uinta, they're calling it a mini Delaware Basin, aka extremely overpressured. And I'm just reading from his tweet: extremely overpressured, stacked pay, and it's much, much, and it's deep in that window of overpressure, which means you're getting absolutely great early production returns. Look at this right now; these XCL wells are doing about 30% higher on a cumulative oil per foot basis wow. than SM is already doing. SM's in the core of the Delaware and Midland Basin right now. That's interesting. All of a sudden, these new wow. wells, and these are wells that have been drilled just since 2021. So we're looking at apples to apples here. Pretty unbelievable. And if you look, these average you into wells are outperforming both Permian and Williston Basin on an average basis by a significant margin, by somewhere around 20,000 bar overall barrels of recoverable oil, which is pretty unbelievable. Only one outlier, which is also crazy. You have an absolutely tight, tight, stacked overlay of statistics there. Really, really interesting acquisition by SM. The only downside I would say is 
the synergies. You notice they're not touting synergies in this. Well, there, there is none. They're not in the UN debate. And so if you're if you work at XCL, you'll probably keep your job. Thank goodness there, because you are the synergies. You're gonna have to keep producing this wow. asset. You're just gonna now be part of a bigger company. Increases, as I mentioned, you know, this represents about eleven or about where would they have it in here? I don't know what it is. Oh yeah, this is about I would say about twenty five ish percent of increase in overall uh, daily oil production. So it does represent a significant chunk there, but SL, but SM Energy goes ahead and dive in there. Let's move over here to shale executives see merger squeezing U.S. oil and gas production via the Dallas Fed survey. Love this, guys. I want to pull out some specific quotes. So just as a reminder, guys, Dallas Fed survey comes out with, or the Dallas Fed comes out with an energy survey every quarter. I um, mean, it's a great barometer on where companies are sitting at. Obviously, it's all anonymous, so they do actually be pretty honest with you. There's a bunch of interesting stuff that got pointed out. One of the big quotes was, consolidation by E&D, E&P firms has curtailed investment and exploration. The last few years of merge M&As have decreased activity in the oil patch. About 48% expect slightly lower output, and another 6% see significantly lower production. Uh, and this leads into some very interesting stuff. So, I mean, you can go read the link. There's a bunch of kind of like overall statistics. What I love to do is go read the comments from the survey responders. They let you leave anonymous surveys. So super interesting, Stu. Here's, here's some that, here, here's one that, first one that jumped out to me. Potential financial assurance bonding requirements are a concern for our business. Interesting. So now we're talking about the whole pay liability side of these, you know, orphan wells. At least somebody's worried about them. I think the problem right. is it's probably not a large corporation because they're the ones shipping it off. Permitting in bureaucratic or political roadblocks are the greatest impairments to our business currently. Operating expenses continue to escalate, and the lack of ability and experience and experience people is a real challenge. Super interesting. Electricity costs are increasing and will continue to increase due to the decrease field combustion and methane emissions. Very interesting. Overregulation of our industry by the federal government is hurting our economy. Interesting. And this is the one that I found interesting. Candidate Trump has promised lower price of oil. He may seek the help of Saudi Arabia to do this. If so, I expect a lower oil price and another recession in the U.S. oil patch. And this brings up what I think wow. is an interesting thread going on right now. Obviously, everybody in the oil, it doesn't take a political genius to figure out that everybody in the oil and gas business would prefer, prefer former President Trump versus President Joe Biden in this next right. four years. But really, is that the case? We know what happened to prices during Trump. There was a downturn in a recession within the oil and gas business for the four years President Trump was in office. There's no two ways to look about it. Yes, we had lower prices at the pump, which is great for the economy, but the oil business in general did not do well. And I think that is secretly what a lot of, I think secretly, if you put a gun to the head of a lot of, and that's a bad term to move, but let's just, but well, if you had a choice of an oil and gas recession or right. higher prices and you make a lot of money, I guarantee you there's a lot of oil and gas leaders in private equity companies, in private back companies, in public companies that secretly would love Joe Biden to get elected because they know that prices are continuing to stay in the $80. $40 oil does nothing for the oil and gas business. It barely keeps the lights on. They're already talking about in another one that we can't find experienced work. Well, that's for field hands, which is a whole nother, you know, story. We've been driving people out of the trades for years and giving people no love for going to work out in the field. Of course, you're not going to find new people to work out in the field. If you tell them you work out in the field, you're an idiot. I mean, it doesn't take a sense to do that. But then you have, I mean, the white collar side of the business gets absolutely trashed during an oil and gas recession. That's who takes it in the shorts. So right. I think it's super interesting. I think, you know, obviously people, the regular the regulatory environment sucks. That was mentioned multiple times in this, but I think people are secretly would it would it be secretly terribly sad if Trump lost, if only because they now know that prices are going to be high? You can't say it's not true. It's the unfortunate. No, I'm part not saying it. it's not true. I just disagree with the fact that I think that this time will be different as far as how low the prices will go under a Trump administration, because the demand for oil around the world is going to remain strong because of the renewable energy slash change it's going to remain strong so even under a, a republican or democrat this time things are, are different on a global perspective
Yeah, I mean, I, I I can understand why you I can understand that thinking, and I actually probably agree with that. But I think you have to. You you mean you? Oh, it's look, there. Well, I, as so many of my friends make more money when the Democrats are in power, stripping it away from the consumers. Prices were oil prices were like forty five fifty dollars on average when Trump was oh. in office. Ain't nobody oh. makes money in that time. So it's it's again, I'm with you. I think oil low oil and gas prices helps the overall economy. But there is this, I'm, and I'm more talking about the interesting thread that we're going to see, we're going to see coming up here because I think it's 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 super. I mean, Trump said it in the debate: "Drill, baby, drill," and I think people want that. But it's hard to drill when your you cost, you know, your break even seventy dollars. True break even. Don't don't listen to these press releases. True break evens at seventy dollars, and prices are at fifty. Well, the supply chain has changed the drilling costs. Yeah, they've gone way up too. Absolutely, that's absolutely. I mean, you you can't go by old supply chain numbers. No, steel's more expensive. Everything is more expensive. So, it's gonna be Biden, a... Biden knocks hit the supply chain. It did. All right, what it, what else? Shoot, what should people be worried about this weekend, Stu? Well, I tell you what, just keep an eye out, your head on a swivel, and uh, let's see. I, I don't know if the Democrats, if are who they're going to run, uh, they're in a pickle. The thing that really makes me the saddest is the fact that, that it is now out in the open. Putin, President Z, Rocket Man, you know, the head of the North Korea, they've all seen that the, our president is not capable of running this country. Yeah. What is going to happen in the next few months with this? Yeah. It, Who knows, guys? But with that, we're going to let you get out of here, get back to work and start your day. We appreciate you checking us out here on the world's greatest energy podcast for Stuart Turley. I'm Michael Tanner. We'll see you tomorrow, folks.